So everything in here I'm going to show are code snippets because you'll then have to think them through in order to experiment with them. And it's really about the principles that are involved here. So we have a, a, a data generator. I have wrote a data generator class because I could have used a library to do the, the test data generation, but that seemed like overkill for what I wanted to do. I, I knew that there was a very small subset of data generation rules that I needed. And what I did was inside the test data generator class itself, I used test-driven design to create these methods so that I knew that it was fairly robust in my automation. And, and to save time, I just embedded those tests within the actual data generator class itself. That's how I generally start working with test data generation and I can refactor those out into a different class if I want to, it doesn't matter. The whole point here is we're trying to get stuff up fast. We know that we can refactor if we have to. In each page model, WebDriver is really useful. It has some functionality for building page object models very, very quickly. It has the, the at find by annotation where you create a, a web element field and annotate that field with how you would find it. So here I'm finding something using an ID and there's the ID that I've, I've encoded in there and you can see just how testable that app was. And the ID would change randomly between releases sometimes. There was no obvious reason why it would change. It would just change. But there was no emphasis on making the app testable so we had to deal with it. But you deal with that in a page abstraction layer where you only have to make that change once. And I don't have to filter that through into other methods because I just made that web element public. So my tests can access that web element directly if I want to. I'm not worried about accessors or getters. doesn't really matter. I'm just going to access it directly because WebDriver is a browser abstraction layer. So I don't necessarily have to build another abstraction layer on top of that one. So this is helping me do that. But what I do is I build methods in the page object that have workflow elements. So I can set a whole bunch of them at once. So instead of entering the title, entering the name, entering the date of birth individually from the test, I'll use the fill in personal details method on the page and abstract that workflow away. I was using the page objects in the setup for the test so that the page object would go to a page and it would scrape all the limits and all the data off that particular page. It knew how to do it because it's modeling the page and it would feed that information back to the test data generator. So in the test itself, we're using data-driven tests. Well, in fact, I'm using one test that's data-driven. And the part of the test that really does the work is the, the parameterization method. It's the one that goes through the basic workflow, pulls all the dropdowns out, works out what the data is, and shuffles it up and randomizes it into a big collection that is then fed through into the test. And the test itself, all it does is take the next row of data from the, the random data generator, works out what context it's in. I've got a data provider that given a big set of data, works out what's appropriate for the next step and feeds that in to the, the page object models to run. And it's a fairly simple application so I can use the implicit weights that come from using the page object factory methods. And it, once it's finished an entire loop, of registering successfully, it tries to log into the system to make sure the end-to-end -end communication is working. It's a fairly simple flow, but there are combinations in there, but again, they're abstracted away from the test and they're controlled by the data and they're coded into the data provider methods. The basic benefits of this were we were able to get up and running very quickly. It found bugs, it found a lot of bugs. Every run found more bugs, which meant that the system wasn't really ready for manual testing because the amount of re repetition we would have to do and it would find bugs that were supposedly fixed in previous releases so the amount of regression that was in there was massive. It found changes into the workflow and because we were scraping the data off the site the workflow was controlled by data so if you said you were from a certain country then it would say well now you have to give me this extra bit of information that's mandatory. This would pick it up because we were hitting every individual data item. And then the workflow was failing for that particular data item. So we could find changes that you might well miss if you're doing manual testing, because then you have to make more strategic decisions about the data that you use. You have to be very definite about filtering your data because you really don't have time. But with the automation, you can just let it run, fire it off, let it run, and forget about it and check the results. Because every failing test is either 
a model problem. It's, it's a, we've modeled the app incorrectly or the, the application has changed in such a way that our model has to change or it's an actual bug. And when all the tests pass, then it's good enough for manual testing. Then it's good enough for us to explore all the error combinations around this application. And this saved a lot of time on manual testing. Consider that we'd had three testers working on this application for four days, that's 12 man days. And we hadn't really got any further into this application other than say these basic things don't work. For the next week and a half, two weeks, these automated tests, this, this automated test with all this data, just ran and ran and ran and found problems that the developers had to fix until it was whittling down the problems, until the test run was almost getting all the way through, when it became viable to start doing manual testing. So we turned it on its head. Instead of doing automated testing to cover regression elements, we were using it to make sure that the application was actually ready in the first place. So the automation really came first before the manual testing. And the types of bugs were found were the odd combination errors that you didn't expect because theoretically a lot of this, all this stuff is really in the same equivalence class and you wouldn't really pick and choose these different things because there was no reason to. But the reasons were the bugs that had been embedded in the back that you can't model, that you wouldn't figure out, that you'd only find by accident. But we found them because we were throwing so much data through this. We found mismatches between the front end and the back end in terms of the validation rules, in terms of the lengths of the fields that were accepted. Because we were randomly generating text at the maximum limits you, that were perfectly viable for the formats that were in place, but not necessarily the back end business rules and different combinations that were quite strange and broken workflows. And we found these bugs because that's what we modeled. You only really find the bugs that your models encompass. And you have to be aware of that. When you're automating, you're automating a very small set of models. So you're only gonna find a subset of bugs. But if they're the appropriate bugs that are gonna impact your testing for manual testing, this is great. Just model it, automate it, find those bugs. There's a whole bunch that you won't find, so then you throw the manual testers at it to find those different classes of bugs that haven't formed part of your automated model that may not even be cost effective to model in an automated way. So the basic lessons from this that you take away if you want to be a macho automator, if you want to do automation the way that MacGyver would do it, if you want to do automation the way the Expandables would do it, the basic principles are automate until it's ready not wait until the system is ready and done all the testing and then automate it. Just do it first, do it in parallel, do it with abstraction layers. Combinatorial filtering is not a mandatory first step. Don't assume that lots of data means you have to do some sort of combinatorial reduction. Work out how long it's gonna to take to just to do all of it. Find out what, figure out what all of it means. Here all of it meant we're gonna run through every individual data element. And the biggest data element is going to control how many tests we've got. So if I've got 250 countries, I'm going to cover each one of those. And that's how many, ultimately, how many data lines I'm going to have. I'm just going to hit each country once. But because I only have 10 different customer classes, I'm going to hit those 10 customer classes 25 times over this set with random data. We're going to hit a lot of combinations. The application's going to change. You, you have to accept that. No one's going to write down what's changed. But the application can tell you under certain circumstances if it's a web app. So figure out how to, how to let it tell you what it wants. And basically my rule is if the application accepts it, then it's valid data. So if I scrape it off your site and I feed it back in and it fails, that's a valid thing to do. My page object models, I was knocking them out quickly. So I didn't add accessors and getters and a whole bunch of things. I didn't make the web elements private. I just made it public. I just went in there. We just hammered it through. I used different abstractions on the page object model to help me simplify the, the tests. But we can refactor later. I don't have to do everything right now. For the helper classes and the random data, we use test driven development for that because we don't want them to impact what we're doing. We need to be fairly sure. We don't have a lot of time to test this. TDD is a great way to knock out simple things really quickly in part of your test framework. So I always try and do TDD for my helper classes, not necessarily for the page objects, but certainly all the helper classes. And also consider modeling the data into main objects. Here, I didn't do that. Here, I just constructed lots of data and fed it in, but I might consider modeling the data in a more complicated way for 
for certain systems. And if, certainly if I want the test to be repeatable, I'll introduce a data domain set of models and have the page objects consume those. So I'll create a user object and feed that into the page objects rather than the individual fields. So that's essentially what we did. It worked. If you want more information on any of the stuff that I've written, you can go to eviltester.com. I've written stuff on compendiumdev.co.uk. That's my, kind of my back history of the software testing. And I wrote a book called Selenium Simplified, which teaches people the basic steps that you have to do in order to start automating your applications using Selenium and using Java. It covers the Selenium 1 API because I think that's an easier API to pick up for beginners than the WebDriver API. So thank you very much for listening.